the, main, the thing that I maintain is that the kids don't play the games because they're games. They play the games because they're intellectually stimulated. But something that they have, just so you are aware of this, you know, we don't have very good systems for our education. But in, when kids play games, everything they have is reviewed and official. They start their own sites to support it. There are sites that are literally schools out there for games <coughs> that were started by kids. Magazines, blogs, and a continuous conversation. So if a kid ever has a question, I don't care if it's, if it's Disney's Toontown or if it's RuneScape, or if it's World of Warcraft, or if it's America's Army, they can find the answer instantly online and they know it. I like to, here's one way I like to think about the games. Because games get this terrible reaction, right? From, you talk to people on the school board legislature, ah, but sports, sports we build huge stadiums for. Sports are wonderful for kids, they help them, they do everything. You learn from team sports, you learn from individual sports. Well, what if games are, and in fact they are, intellectual sports? And they are because we know that because there are competitions in them. Because kids are earning hundreds of thousands of dollars playing, being what they call now cyber athletes. So hey, if, why not have leagues? Why not have this kind of stuff going on in our schools? Intellectual sports. When it comes to games and when it comes to all this stuff, and we say we're competing with after school, a lot of people think they can't, right? So they go back to what they know how to do and they say, forget it, I can't compete. And what they're almost always thinking about is the graphics. They're almost always thinking about the fact that a, you know, a game on an Xbox 360, a game on a PlayStation 3 has these incredible lifelike graphics and those games cost $15 million to build or more. So how can I compete? I don't have $15 million to do my lesson plan tonight, unfortunately. But the answer is that it's not a war of graphics and it's not a war of money. It's a war of ideas. And the way I got to this conclusion was I said, let me just look at the top selling games and see what they're promising the kids. So a couple of years ago when I started this, the top three games were these, City of Heroes, it still exists. It's a game, an online multiplayer game, Harry Potter game on the PS2, and a Rise of Nations game. What do they promise the kids? There's a place we can all be heroes. Harry needs his friends. The entire span of human history is in your hands. That's powerful stuff. And it's true. And then they have adjectives and they have verbs, create, thrilling, you know, Fun, encounter, engage, fly, explore, exciting, challenging. Master, amass, build, perform, research, lead. You know, wouldn't it be great if we were teaching our kids to do all those things? That's what they're learning in the games. And are they learning it? Yeah, because those are the top selling games. And if they weren't learning anything, if they weren't getting it out of it, those games would not get bought, as many of the games don't. I went a year later. We should update this for this year, but it was Battlefield 2. You, you, you do everything that causes you to rise through the ranks, which means you start commanding more and more people. You're in charge of more complex things. The Sims, you actually mix genes. You're starting to see what progeny looks like when you mix the genes. Stuff we, you know, we don't get much to do that in biology these days. Guild Wars, you meet your friends, you tackle quests, you see the influence of what you do on your future things that we just lecture kids about. Commercial games, things that teachers have taken off the shelf, gone into the store, paid 50 bucks for, or some of these go way down to 10 bucks even, and brought into the classroom. Civilization 3 or Civilization 4 now. An incredibly complex game about starting at the dawn of civilization, making decisions. It's a turn-based game, so it's actually relatively easy to use in front of a class all the categories of things you need to make decisions about, you know, what are you gonna grow, how much are you gonna spend, how are you gonna put your bu how are you gonna allocate your budget? Are you gonna choose to be warlike? Are you gonna choose to be uh, somebody who grows your civilization through the arts? Are you gonna choose to grow your civilization through alliances? You can, there's just everything that you could possibly want. That's a simulation, right? Um, Europa Universalis is about European history. And both of those games have been used by graduate students 
in their doctoral program so that their theses are online, if you want to read somebody's thesis. But look at all the things that there are history games about. I mean, I maintain that there's nothing we teach that there isn't a game about, or there shouldn't be one soon. I, maybe there's not a game about the pilgrims, but there probably is. Um, probably a game about Sam Houston, the Alamo, all that kind of stuff, you know. The Sim City stuff. That stuff is cheap. In fact, some of the earliest versions are free now to educators. The tycoon games. Um, anything called a tycoon game, whether it's airline, airport, casino, circus, cruise ship, is the same thing. It's a game around an underlying economic model. And you buy and sell and try to become successful. My, one, of, one of the favorites that I have is the one here on the right, which is Trailer Park Tycoon. <laughs> right? So there's something for everybody. This is for keyboarding. This is the best thing ever invented. This is the House of the Dead, which is a game about shooting mummies, transformed by Sega into the typing of the dead. So the mummies come at you, and the only way to defeat them is to type quickly and accurately. <laughs> and I kid you not, in Japan, this is an arcade game. And if you go into the Sega arcade in Japan or the Sony Joy Plus arcade, you'll see two screens and two keyboards, and I've watched two junior high school girls in their uniforms come in, sit down at two keyboards, and type each other to death for 15 minutes. And, you know, walk out really happy. So this stuff can be done. That one used to be in stores. Now I think it's free. You can get it on the Internet. It's so old. Then there's custom games. If you're teaching physics and you want to teach about Coulomb's Law, MIT made a game for you. You know, it's hard to understand that the, that the um, attraction between two particles is inversely proportional to their distance, to the square of their distance, excuse me. But here you've got to move things around. So that exists. You can get it from MIT. Immunology, this is the Federation of American Scientists doing this. It's built, or at least a, proto, a couple of prototypes of, of this are built. An environmental game exists from MIT. You can use the games for persuasion. America's Army is a free game. A lot of kids play it. It's also a piece of propaganda. Because whenever you play America's Army, you're the American Army. You're never the other side. If you're playing another guy, they think they're America. You think. But there's also a game from, about Palestinian freedom fighters. Wouldn't that be interesting? So you can compare and contrast. There's plenty of opportunity, depending on what the curriculum says you should be doing. This is the game I was talking about, Making History. Um, they've just gotten an, uh, a deal with some publisher. Teacher made a game. This is a totally teacher made mini game, Surviving the Spanish Inquisition. A guy came to me and said, Do you want to see a game about the Spanish Inquisition? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really into it. But he showed it to me, and it turned out that it was about you had to answer the questions properly, and based on how you answered them, you either got killed or you got exiled. So I kept, you know, by the end of the game, I'm shouting, I can do this, I can do it. exile me, exile me, don't kill me. Game about business management, ma making decisions and seeing how people react. It's a simulation, it's in the marketplace. This is a game called September 12th where you, you try to, you can go in and you can bomb as many buildings as you want, but then you, the terrorists start to grow as you do the bombing. It's a political persuasion game, ethnography game, you get to play a family you get assigned to being the daughter of a poor Mexican family or a rich American family or a, some, somewhere around the world based on real data, and you watch that person grow up. This is nursing. This is a game that was just sold to Google. Wonderful little game. The guy who made this game just won the MacArthur Genius Prize, where we're adding tags. Now, this was something that the kid said, I couldn't believe it, that, that Google Images is blocked. Now, Google, all those things you laughed at, those funny images, they all came from Google Images. I just went and searched and found images online. It's very useful to search for images, except that the images don't have the right meta tags on them. So you need to add tags. He invented a game where we match you up with somebody else, and the tags like wolf and shadow are taboo, and you each type in words till you get a match. 
Well, that's a great game for kids to tell them, well, how do you describe pictures? What are the words that you could do? It's a lot of fun. It's free. So all the categories, and this is socialimpactgames.com is where you can find a list of all these games. That's one of my sites. Um, they're all there. The only issue about these games is what we said, that the classrooms weren't designed, you know, can you believe it? They built our classrooms and they didn't think about electronic games. This is the game that we've just come up with. If any of you are interested in being a beta tester of this game, I'll let you be a free beta tester. Teacher goes in, puts in questions, creates questions about anything, assigns a name to that game, and says, okay, kids, you go to that URL and your game is going to come up and it's either going to be a quiz game or a Jeopardy game or a Flash game or uh, any one of these different kinds of games. So it's really an automatic thing that a teacher who has a set of questions or wants to make them up or wants to steal somebody else's or share somebody else's, excuse, share somebody else's, they can do that and you can do it overnight. You can change this every day. Game programming. That's, this speaks to the curriculum. If I were to add one thing to the curriculum, it would be game, it would be programming. And game programming is a great way because you get them to learn programming, which they're going to need to use in the future, because everything is about programming, all this digital technology. That's the key literacy. And then they get to create the game-based curriculum, which we talked about. If everybody created a little game about a little piece of the curriculum, we'd have one. And already around the world, we're seeing elementary schools using some tools, middle schools using Flash, high schools using the modding I talked about. We're seeing this happen, mostly in after-school programs. And here's, I like to show this, this picture, which is something called a large-scale gaming event. That is 6,000 kids who have brought themselves and their computers to a location on a weekend so that they could play games together. They have totally student organized, filled up this room, put the thing there, plugged in every computer to a server so they don't have the time lag over the internet, and then they tear that down after three days. Those things go on all over the place. There's the World Cyber Olympics, there's a whole lot of things. That could be your district. 